Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that when you left uh, this earth, you, you had a plan for the Bible itself to be collated and to be put together because when you left, uh, the Bible wasn't complete yet. But the canon of the Bible, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was put together uh, over time. And the canon of the Bible is complete. Uh, we have the full Bible. Uh, and the Bible itself gives us so much that we need to know in terms of building our relationship with you, our connection with you. And we can consider it such a privilege to be able to come together as a people uh, to learn, uh, to learn about what you would want us to know to learn about your heart for those that don't yet know you, to learn about the commandments you've given us to be able to help others come into a relationship with you. So as we learn the word today from the book of Acts, Lord, would you uh, just speak to us individually. May I step out of the way. May the Holy Spirit use me as an instrument to share, and uh, may your Holy Spirit speak to individual hearts as to what they, you want them to take away. In Jesus' name, everybody said. So if you are a Netflix watcher, you'd be binge-watching series. This is season three of Dirty Streets, episode two. Um, so we're walking through or journeying through the book of Acts. Um, and uh, I've got the privilege of covering Acts chapter five, verse, um, I think, 19 to 39. So I want to focus in and zone in like a, like a um, magnifying glass on a subsection of that entire passage. But before I do that, I want to set the tone and just to, I guess, bring this all up to speed. So if you've not caught the last few sermons, that's okay. If you're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay as well. So this, the book of Acts was set in a time round about a couple of years after a man called Jew, uh, Jesus, a Jewish man, uh, lived on this earth for over 30 years and he made a claim that he is the Messiah or the Savior, uh, the one that the Jewish culture, the Jewish people had been waiting hundreds of years for. He made this claim, and obviously at the time, the Jewish people would refer to their scriptures and go, is this the man? Right? And I would say that at the time, there were other pretenders that claimed also to be the Messiah. But the thing was that Jesus said that he would be crucified, he would die, and three days later he would rise again. And indeed, he did. He was crucified, murdered, he was buried, and three days later he rose again. And two years later, the book of Acts, all these things that we've been studying and what we're going to be looking at today as well, is set around two years after all of that craziness happened. You have to remember the context of the situation, that the Jewish people were waiting for a, a conquering king, this, this incredible king that would come on a white horse with a massive you know, six-pack, shield, uh, you know, to, to destroy the Roman Empire at the time. But Jesus was born as a, a little baby, in a tiny little town, way outside the, the heart of the action. He grew up in a pretty um, normal life. He took a job as a carpenter, which is a skilled job, but it wasn't an amazing job that would get people's attention. And then in three years, when he turned 30, that's when his ministry started. He started going around making this bold claim that he is indeed that Messiah, right? So the Jewish people, the leaders, the, the ruling councils at the time, you can imagine these people would be very skeptical. There were hundreds of years of traditions that had been built up uh, for the Jewish people to do all of these things, to bring sacrifices, to go to a temple, to have all these practices and then Jesus comes and goes, my life replaces all of this. My death, burial, and resurrection replaces all of this. He brings a new law. And the followers of Jesus, you can just imagine that these new people that actually witnessed Jesus' lives, Jesus' life, the, this new group of people called the Way, they were a little cult that was called the way that then subsequently became Christianity. 
these people would have been seen by society as outcasts. These people would have been seen as some crazy people that are trying to go up against hundreds of years of traditions. Can you imagine? There's a very different context today in 2024. There's over three billion Christians in this world. Yes, many countries, including New Zealand, uh, are post-Christians. Uh, you know, not many Christians in New Zealand anymore. But the context is very, very different. And we pick it up here. If you go to uh, Acts chapter 4, I preached this about three weeks ago. Um, it, it, it spoke about how the apostles and the disciples were chucked in prison, and then they were released, and they had a prayer meeting, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them boldness to continue preaching the word. And then last week, Pastor Richard in Acts chapter 5 spoke about how these disciples were chucked in prison again, right? So remember the context. This is a, a very fledgling crew of people that are claiming some incredible thing that no one in society predicted, and most people in the society didn't believe. And then again, a miracle happened, right, Pastor Richard? Like, imagine if you are the, the ruling council, right? For the nth time, you put these people in prison, and you tell them, do not preach, do not spread this craziness, because, you see, if what Jesus teaches is true, it means all of these traditions are no longer true. Can you imagine the jobs on the line, these religious leaders? Can you imagine the redundancies? Oh, I said the word. Right? And it wouldn't have been due to an economic crisis. This would be a religious crisis in Jerusalem. That an entire network and system would have to change if this was true. And so, of course, these people were thinking that their jobs were on the line, these religious leaders. They're like, I want to put them in prison again and tell them, do not teach the, uh, the word. And then what happens? The next day, Pastor Richard, they're back in the marketplace talking about this, the, the gospel. They're like, how on earth do these people, I, we can't keep them in. And then we pick up today's scripture in Acts chapter 5, verse 26. And let me read this to you. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them. Right, so they went to the temple courts and brought them back in. But not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So this ruling council, this people with power, they are now afraid. Why were they afraid of this little fledgling crew, this minority? Why? Because they could see that there's power Amen. in this new yes. fledgling religion called the way. Because yes. they were afraid that there would be mass sort of riots. Because the people are starting to believe that this is true. Not just these few people, but, you know, like in, in the early parts of Acts, it talks about how the apostle Peter preached and 5,000 people gave their lives. So, so in the context of society, it wasn't a very little group, but it wasn't a massive group. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you have Fill Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us? But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. Love it. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on the tree. God exalted him to the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we, everyone say we, we are witnesses. To these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Reading on, verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, great baby name if you're looking for a baby name, Gamaliel was actually one of the most famous and respected teachers, a Pharisee, that the Apostle Paul, who was then Saul, was a student of Gamaliel before he became Paul. That's the context. So 
So Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up, right, in the council. So the, the, the apostles were away, and these are just in, in, in-house meetings. This is one of the Tuesday staff meetings, Pastor Richard, right? Okay, slightly different, but... And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men, Gamaliel says to the leaders, for before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all those who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He, too, perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. Remember Gamaliel, very respected leader. He's telling the rest of his fellow leaders this. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. I love that part in the scripture earlier. It says, and we are witnesses to these things. It reminds me of a, a song by Brooke Fraser, who's now Brooke Lidgetwood. He's, she's got you know, her secular brand, Brooke Fraser, and the, the worship brand, Brooke Lidgetwood. And in 2005, she wrote a, a song called Albertine. It became a, an album. And um, this song was inspired when she went on a mission trip to Rwanda, and she met a little girl called Albertine, and she wrote uh, this song about her. And I want to read some of these words from the song. It says, Now that I've seen, I am responsible. Faith without deeds is dead. Now that I've held you in my own arms, I cannot let you go. I'm on a plane across a distant sea, but I carry you in me, and the dust on, and the dust on, and the dust on my feet, Rwanda. Now that I have seen, I am responsible. Faith without deeds is dead. Now that I've held you in my own arms, I cannot let go till you are. I will tell the world, I will tell them where I've been. I will keep my word, I will tell them, Albertine. Now that I've seen... I am responsible. Faith without deeds is dead. Now that I've held you in my arms, I cannot let go until you are. I'm on a stage. A thousand eyes are on me. I will tell them, Albertine. I will tell them, Albertine. Today's sermon title is Now That I've Seen. I want to highlight a few scriptures here, right, in that passage. Firstly, this, this, this part where the council was speaking to, the, to Peter and the apostles, and they said, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Can you imagine? Jerusalem wasn't exactly the biggest place, but it wasn't exactly tiny either. In a couple of years, they have filled this entire place with the teaching that opposes the mainstream culture and teaching. Can you believe this? I don't know what the equivalent is in Auckland in New Zealand in 2024. But whatever the mainstream predominant worldview in Auckland, New Zealand 2024 today, imagine someone teaching something completely opposing that. And it fills the entire city of Auckland in a couple of years. That is not something that humans can do. Just by the way, why isn't Auckland filled with this teaching? And then I want to move on to another part of the scripture. It says, the, the Peter and the apostle responded. I love the boldness, eh? They're in front of these people that have put them in prison. They want to kill them. And then they, they just responded very simply. They didn't have to go through, you know, a three-hour treatise and on, on history or whatever. They just responded very briefly, and they said this, we must obey God rather than men. Wow. A novel idea. The God of our fathers who raised Jesus. And we, now that we have seen, and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Remember Acts chapter 4 that I preached about three weeks ago when they were having a prayer meeting? What, 
Who came upon them? The Holy Spirit. And what happened? The Holy Spirit gave them boldness. And the result of that boldness was Jerusalem was filled with the teaching, this new novel teaching that opposes the mainstream teaching. And when they were charged and reminded to stop doing that, all they could say was, we have to obey God because we are witnesses. You know, I, um, I'm a foodie. Any foodies in the house? You know, uh, Pastor Richard and I are very different on this. I travel for food. He thinks that's a waste of money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, he would travel for the tennis, you know, yeah. the, you know, all that. But I'm a foodie, right? So let's bring up that next slide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is not a promotional activity. I'm not getting any commission from this burger store. But um, Rita brought me to this um, Korean chicken place, uh, I don't know, about a year ago. And I can tell you it was, it was close to life-changing. It was very, very good. <laughs> and then I went to work on a Tuesday staff meeting. It was a shared lunch. And then lo and behold, my friend Abby Mendoza orders the same chicken from Ziggle. And I must say that she is indeed the most um, vocal evangelist for Ziggle. And then I suddenly notice, you know when you, you start looking for something, you start noticing it everywhere, right? And then I saw it on the work fridge on level three, if you ever want to go visit, you can see. Is it still there? On the fridge, there's a Ziggle pamphlet. <laughs> like this thing is everywhere. I must say that after a few months, I am now a full Ziggle convert. <laughs> did someone preach the gospel of Ziggle to me? What did Rita do? What did Abby do? Did we have a session, a good sesh, discussing <laughs> the theology of Ziggle? No. Did we look into the YouTube video about the creation of Ziggle and the herbs and spices that are in Ziggle, the chicken? Well, no. I experienced Ziggle. <laughs> Sermon over, let's say. <laughs> And I'm sure when we, you guys get to discuss this, it will be talking about Ziggle. Next slide. For lunch. Yeah, there's a Ziggle in, on K Road and one in Mount Eden and one else. Anyway. I love this verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You know, I, I want often, you know, being a foodie, when, the, when I read this, this verse, it, it, it invokes certain emotions in me, right? When I, I, I see the word taste. And, and, and like, so often we, when we come to faith and religion and so forth, we're like, you know, there's one way of, of, we have to study, we have to, yes, all of those are important and depends on how you're wired. But you see, the thing about tasting and seeing, it means that, People from different cultures and different walks of life have taste buds, right? And all of their, them have slightly different taste buds. Now, the only way you would experience and encounter and know what a certain food tastes like is to try it. It may not be in line with your taste buds, and that's okay. There's different types and brands of K-chicken. But you have to taste it. You can't hear someone else tell you about Ziggle. You can't have a conversation about Ziggle. You can't go to conferences about Ziggle. You can't hear podcasts about Ziggle and then never taste Ziggle. Mm -mm. Taste and see. I love it. It talks about the senses. 
When we experience Jesus, it's all of our senses. When you worship God, when you experience like the butterflies in your tummy, when you read the scripture and it clicks and you're like, man. But if you don't, you would never, ever be able to fully know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I want to contrast the church in the early days and the church today. Let's put up those pictures, right? I, I googled church in the first century, and I came up with pictures like this, right? A marketplace, uh, like a room with a bunch of old men with beards, looking like they're eating some stuff. Uh, you've got some, some, the bottom picture there, you know, some older people with some kids sitting around. I'm assuming they're having a korero around the campfire with the koro telling the stories about how Jesus spoke to him 30 years ago, passing it on to the next generation. That's the picture of the church. And then next slide, that seems to be the prevailing picture of the church today. Yeah, it's good to worship in rows. I love worshiping in rows. I love going to stadiums filled with people, incredible sound system. I love all of those things. I love sitting on my laptop watching a sermon. I love looking at things on my phone. How is the church today similar to the church in the early first century? You know, I always go back to the very first encounter of something. When something organically comes out, often that is in response to what it's meant to be. It's not always the case, but what I'm saying is that in the early church, go back to the previous slide, these people had just encountered Jesus. They had just tasted the gospel, and it happened everywhere. You know, often people go, how do I do evangelism? And I'm like, what's your favorite food? Oh, I love dumplings. Tell me your best dumpling shop you've been to. Oh, it's that thing, blah, 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 like detailed description, right? And I'm like, are you an introvert? Yeah, I am, I am, I am. Have you told anyone about this dumpling shop? Yeah. Yes, I have. <laughs> do you catch what I'm trying to say here? Like, when you've tasted and seen something that is so incredibly and has changed your life, God can use you as an extrovert, an introvert, a, oh, I don't speak English. Don't worry. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> You see, uh, I want to kind of close with a couple of these points. Next, next slide, back to the, yeah, that one. I want to highlight here that when, when the apostles, right, so Peter standing up there and there's a couple of his homies at the back, you know, and then the whole group of them outside waiting. His response always starts with, We must obey God rather than men, and we are witnesses to these things. Uh, I mean, I've read this before, but it's only just stood out to me this week as I was preparing. You see, they tasted and saw all of these things in community. See, today's society, this modern society that we're in, is so isolated. We sit in rows, and we look at the back of people's heads, we come to an incredible worship service, and we go home. You see, in this church, that's why we prioritize connect groups. That's why we say that we're not just a church with connect groups, we're a church of connect groups. And if you can't come to a church service because we only have one service, then find yourself in a small group somewhere. That's, we've got small groups everywhere. Because where there's a gathering of God's people, where there's a devotion to God's word and unpacking of God's word, and for sure if there's food, 
and there's worship, and there's generosity, and there's love, that is what ecclesia looks like. That's what the church is meant to be. You, if you think that coming to, to church, sitting in rows uh, once a week is, is your, I've done my duty, so I, I'm sorry. You're getting the, you're getting the crumbs. And that's, if someone goes to church every week and that's all they do, in New Zealand, that's, committed, that's considered a committed Christian. You know, a committed Christian in New Zealand is someone that goes to church once a month. Not only are they getting the crumbs, they're getting the dust. How did we get here? How did we get from a group of people that were willing to die? They were willing to die. What are we eating and tasting today, my friends? We have the Bible, the same Bible. The Bible that was intended for us to take until Jesus comes again to read, to learn. We have the same Holy Spirit that filled these people with boldness in the face of death. What has happened? What has happened? I don't know what the solution is. But you know, friends, I want to encourage us that the fact that you're here means that majority of you are committed Christians. Is this enough for you? You know? Yes, by all means, go to disciple makers and learn the techniques of how to share your faith. But do you think you will share your faith if you don't taste and see over and over and over and over again? I don't know how your taste buds look like or feel like. I don't know what you need specifically. But you know, in today's society, there is way more resources than you could properly shake a stick at. (laughs) You know, there's just no excuse. My question to you and I is that are we are we willing to obey? Are we hungry enough to taste? Are we distracted, so distracted by life itself that we've forgotten what, what it tastes like? You see, this, this verse says we must obey God rather than men. And then it goes on to say we are witnesses to these things. And I want to kind of join those two sentences together and say this. We must obey God rather than men because we are witnesses to these things. So if you've never witnessed God, really, and you've been going to church all your life, ask God, let me, Lord, help me witness the power of a relationship with you. Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to touch your heart fresh again. Ask the Holy Spirit, because that's the only source. There's no, I can't give you a three steps to a closer relationship with Jesus. It'll just say, read your Bible, pray every day. <laughs> and if you don't do that, and you ha- don't have a desire to do that, it just won't, won't work. But will you, will you take this on board? Will you step out of these doors and forget what I say? And that's okay, I'm not offended. But will you be so desperate, get on your knees where nobody's looking at you, and plead with the Holy Spirit to say, I want to be like those early disciples. Whatever is a distraction, Lord, take it away because I want to taste and see. And out of the overflow of that tasting and seeing, that you, it'll be you telling everybody about how good God is because you'll be talking about things that are real to you that has happened to you not in 1985, but this week. Because our God is living and active. And the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword able to judge the intentions of the heart. So in conclusion, let's taste and see. Let's not do it alone. 
Let's find friends that will do this with us. Let's do it in community. Because it's so easy, right? You know, when, when we talk about going to the gym, a lot of people sign up for the gym and they don't, never go. It's a good industry. If you want to get into business, right? <laughs> but then when you think about something like CrossFit, you know, the CrossFit. <laughs> when you think about CrossFit, why is it so thriving? Because people do it in community. 5 a.m. Who wakes up at 5 a.m. and gets all sweaty? <laughs> oh, bro, I'm waiting for you. They're doing it in community. They're keeping each other accountable. Let's taste and see in community and let's fill our society with the gospel that we would be accused again. We've told you to stop teaching this, but you have filled Auckland with this teaching. May that happen in yours and my lifetime. Same human beings, two eyes, two ears, one nose, and a mouth. Same Holy Spirit. What's the difference? It'll happen again. I'm convinced. Please, Lord. So now that I've seen... Now that I've seen and tasted together. Let's close our eyes for a moment of focus and privacy and I want to pray for a couple of groups of people and then we'll have a time of discussion. Let's give each other some time of privacy to process this. Let's have a think about what we've heard and what God is saying to us right now. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I want to pray for two groups of people, no one looking around. First group, uh, you're a Christian. You've been a Christian for a while, and things seem a little bit dry. Um, You've lost your passion. You've lost the spark. And something today you've heard has made you think, man, I, I I I need the Holy Spirit's help. I want to pray for you. If that's you, on a count of three, would you gently raise your hand so that I know who I'm praying for. One, two, three. Yep, a couple of people. Great. A couple of people. Most of you are passionate on fire for Jesus. I love it. Lord, these hands, these people that have put their hands up, Lord, I, I pray for them, Lord. Lord, they're saying that they want to taste and see like the early disciples. They want to be able to be overflowing with compassion for others because they've received compassion from you. Lord, would you help them? Holy Spirit, would you fill them in such a way like the early disciples that they would fill their communities, that they will fill society with a teaching about Jesus because they've encountered you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. I still close, a second group of people. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you're not a Christian, and, um, or maybe you once walked with Jesus, and for whatever reason, you've, you've walked away. Maybe it's pretty difficult. You feel a bit hurt. But something you've heard today has made you realize it's time, it's time to come back to Jesus. I want to pray for you, not for you to become a Christian, but I'd love to pray that God will guide you back to a relationship with Him. Not a Christian, or once walked with Jesus. On a count of three, I'd love to pray for you. Would you gently lift your hands and I, so that I can pray for you? One, two, three. Anyone coming to Jesus or coming back to Him? All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your the, the Bible. I thank you for this passage, Lord. As we Take some time to discuss the Word of God. Would you help us to to share openly, to be encouraging to each other as we taste and see in community. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.